So hi everyone. Um, like Professor Narayanan said, uh, my name is Nicholas Krishten. Um, I'm a software engineer at uh, at Datacratic, um, and uh, I'm pretty excited to, to talk to you guys today about about what we do in uh, in online advertising. Uh, who here is a big fan of online advertising? Big fan. All right. Who here uses an ad blocker? Oh, come on. Everybody. Okay. Uh, I don't mind. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, that was the interactive part of the conversation where everyone laughs and I get to know you, so that's good. Uh, so about me, uh, I'm a software engineer at Datacratic. I've been there for about five years. The company's been around for about five years. Um, we're just down the street. Uh, I kind of booked it over here after uh, finishing to prepare my presentation. Uh, and what Just give me one second. I want to turn off these sure. lights if possible. I forget how it works. Is it here or is it on that screen? Yeah. Anybody? I think no, it's this thing here, right? No. no. I think I can close the screen. Right? Okay, so wasn't there a light? Behind me. It's just, uh, I'm used to being up here, and uh, <laughs> for, for me, it's a bit hard to read if it's, uh, yeah, that's much better. Sorry, yeah. Okay, and feel free to just raise your hand, talk to me, whatever, and like just sort of do this if I talk too fast. Um, so, what we specialize in at Datacratic is machine learning. Machine learning is really exciting and interesting, and if you guys want, we can talk about it after. <laughs> um, but this part of the talk is about uh, online advertising. Uh, but, but uh, you know, two second plug for, for Datacratic. Uh, we've built basically MLDB. It's a machine learning database. It's our main product. It's open source. You can check it out at mldb.ai. Uh, what I do at Datacratic right now is I am the product owner, uh, I'm the product manager for that product. So, I sort of determine the roadmap for that, uh, and I work with the software engineers we have to develop these machine learning algorithms. Um, and the reason I'm here today is because uh, one of the main products that Datacratic sells and has sold over the past few years um, is sort of an MLDB-powered product for the advertising technology industry. So advertising technology often gets sorted into ad tech. Um, and, uh, and when your professor asked me if I could give a talk about this, I looked at the textbook, and I was like, oh my god, I'm so jealous. I'm jealous of this textbook that you know, it didn't exist when I started five years ago because it's got like half the theory that I feel like I spent a bunch of time piecing together from different papers and stuff. So you guys, you guys are lucky that, uh, that this textbook exists. So this course is extremely relevant to some of the stuff that we do uh, for our customers in the advertising technology industry. And so uh, this talk, basically, I'm going to introduce a little bit about the advertising industry um, and about a little bit about online advertising who the players are, what they do, what they care about, uh, to sort of frame up how it applies to the sort of meat of this course, which is uh, the, the relevant part of the course, which is uh, auctions. Um, so hopefully that will be interesting to you guys. So the advertising industry, I, um, I apologize in advance, I don't have a ton of graphics in my, in my deck. Uh, in the beginning it's easy because there's logos and after a while it gets super abstract and the only image that comes up when you like Google image search auctions is a little hammer, right, for like, that's useless. So <laughs> anyhow, uh, the advertising industry in general, like think big, uh, is obviously a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, and it's basically comprised of three different types of parties, right? You've got advertisers who basically want to buy people's attention. They would like to, you know, pay for the right to show you something. Uh, and obviously, they're mostly interested in showing uh, advertising to the right people at the right time. That's what that's what uh, their their business is. Uh, and you know, they're trying to sell cars. They're trying to sell soap. They're trying to sell services. They're trying to sell apps, uh, whatever it is that they're trying to sell. So I put uh, Procter and Gamble's logo up there in the corner. Procter and Gamble is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, advertiser in the world. They sell I don't know ivory soap and. Uh, dishwashing liquid. Um, and the reason we have what are called soap operas um, on daytime television is basically because during, um, in the, you know, in the sort of 50s and 60s, the main uh, funding source for television during the daytime was Procter and Gamble and Co., uh, who would try and sell, uh, sorry, you know, buy advertising for soap during daytime television. So that's why they're called soap operas. Because really, that's where the word comes yeah, from. They come from, yeah. Come from, I see. Yeah, I because it, it was essentially, you know, daytime television mm -hmm. with sort of fairly formulaic plot lines. Uh, and, you know, advertisers basically figured, rightly or wrongly, that, that people watching daytime television would be interested in soap. And so all the ads would be about soap. Um, on the other side, you have publishers. So a publisher is basically anybody who's willing to sell a slice of someone's attention um, <coughs> by showing ads alongside what's called content. So, you know, every author in the world feels like they're writing something very important, very meaningful, but as far as the advertising industry is concerned, content, sort of undifferentiated block of something which grabs your attention. I don't subscribe to this notion, but this is how we talk about it. <laughs> um, so essentially, a publisher is anyone who 
owns and operates a television station, a newspaper, a radio, uh, or a website, right? These are all essentially uh, publishers in the sense that they have content. So if you're watching TV, you have television programs. If you go to the movies, that's content. Uh, and uh, those people are willing to essentially sell a slice of your and my attention to the people uh, at the top. So uh, as, a, as a sort of example of a uh, publisher, a uh, sort of very classical publisher we think about, you've got the New York Times. Right? The New York Times has a newspaper, and they sell their newspaper. They don't really make most of their money from people buying the newspaper. They make most of their money from uh, advertisers selling ads in the newspaper. I'm sure everyone knows this. Um, and in the bottom, you have sort of middlemen. Uh, and I apologize, the word middlemen is, is very gendered, but it's uh, middle persons sounds very difficult to say. So I use middlemen, but I don't mean men. Um, although that's Don Draper, and he's very much a man's man. Uh, who here has watched Mad Men, the television show? Okay. Um, so uh, middlemen sort of traditionally kind of help the two advertisers and publishers get together. So creative agencies, for example, you know, if you're trying to sell a car, you don't just phone up the New York Times, right? You kind of talk to someone else first, and that someone else will maybe know someone at the New York Times, or they will draw up the ad, take the picture. These are all kind of the gears of the advertising industry. And there are other uh, functions like media monitoring. So if you're a car maker and you want to, uh, you know, you buy uh, the right to show ads in the New York Times, you tend to pay someone to make sure that your ad showed up in the New York Times. Um, if you are trying to do a sort of nationwide ad campaign, um, you want to make sure that, you know, you, you plan it correctly, right? So there are a whole bunch of radio stations in the world. There's a whole bunch of TV stations in the world. There's a bunch of magazines. You're going to pay someone to kind of figure out how much of your money to uh, spend in each, each different category. So I haven't talked a lot about the internet, but this is basically the advertising industry, uh, the way we, we traditionally think about it. So within that, there's obviously online advertising. Online advertising is mostly the same, right? You've got advertisers, you've got the same advertisers basically. You go online without your ad blocker, you're gonna see a lot of ads for cars, soap, not so much. Procter & Gamble doesn't advertise online so much. Beer, yep. Um, and there's a lot more apps. So I put the sort of mobile strike uh, logo up there. I don't know if you guys get targeted by the same ads I do, but um, this has just been everywhere online. It's just, it's on TV, it's on YouTube, it's, uh, it's a, a game on the, on the iPhone. Um, I don't advertise for them, sorry. <laughs> um, publishers, it's basically the same kind of publishers, right? Like most TV stations have a website and you can watch TV on the internet now. That wasn't always the case. Uh, most newspapers have websites. In fact, some newspapers no longer have any paper. Right? La Presse is essentially gone uh, app only, uh, or online only. Um, radios are all online. So the publishers and the advertisers are essentially the same players. There's some new ones, right? Obviously, uh, Google was not sort of an old world publisher, although, although they're certainly a major publisher today. And I put the Facebook logo here because Facebook obviously takes up a vast amount of uh, our online attention. Some double digit percentage of the time that people spend on the internet is on Facebook. So they're definitely a publisher because they sell ads, right? Um, and so in the middlemen category, there are many, many more middlemen for online advertising. Uh, this is, oops, maybe I copied that slide twice. This is a slide that you probably won't be able to see from the back. Um, but uh, it's what's called the LumaScape. So there's these people called the Luma Partners who are kind of industry analysts. And every quarter, they put out a new version of this slide. So every little colorless blob here is a logo of a company. And this is basically an industry analysis of the online uh, advertising industry. So over here, you have marketers, which I've called advertisers. And way down at the end there in black, that's you and me, consumers. And right before that, there's publishers. And everybody in here in between, each little logo here is one company that is one of the middlemen between the marketer uh, and the publisher. And so Datacratic, I'm going to kind of uh, spoil it for you, Datacratic, we sell software to people in and around here. So I, I won't go through this whole thing because it's invisible and it's just a lot of logos. It's a lot of links. Yes. So, you know, the marketers are, you know, I don't know, there's a, there's a pack of length uh, six or seven in there. Absolutely. Possibly more. Huh? Yeah. So, so obviously, you know, you get your first glimpse of sort of network theory is applied to, to this industry. Um, so, so why the heck are there so many middlemen online? And, uh, and why didn't I, didn't I talk about any middlemen in the sort of not online section? So first of all, um, you know, I, I got into this business about five years ago, um, in this, you know, selling software to, to advertising technology companies. So I don't know a lot about how advertising was done 30 years ago. I've watched Mad Men. That's pretty much it. Um, but there are, there are somewhat fewer middlemen. Um, 
So the reason for that is that essentially with the internet um, and with the web, let's say, there's new technologies, new opportunities, and a whole bunch of new complexity. So let me kind of give you a bit of a caricature of the picture of why. So offline, TV, newspaper, um, impressions, we call them impressions. So every single uh, time you see an ad, like a physical embodiment of one ad is called an impression. It's called an impression because it used to be impressed onto paper, right? So you used to print newspapers, and so you call them impressions. So an impression is essentially one printing of a single ad. And in fact, in ad tech, we don't really talk about ads. We talk about impressions, being the physical embodiment, and the creative, the creative being sort of the picture that you see. So an impression is a physical embodiment of a creative. Um, so offline, they're basically sold by phone or by fax. Right? Someone at the ad agency who made the creative, who filmed the ad, who kind of drew whatever the picture is, uh, would phone up somebody, or more often would get phoned up right, at the New York Times and say, hi, uh, next month, so way ahead of time, in internet time, I would like to buy 100,000 impressions, please. Okay? And so they had a rate card, and they would look it up. It was all very manual. Um, and all the costs were quoted in what we call CPM, cost per mil. It's basically a fancy way of saying cost per thousand. It doesn't sound fancy in Quebec because we know what mill means. But, um, so basically, if you wanted to show an ad, you would phone up the New York Times and you'd say, I want, a, I want 100,000 and I want to pay 20. And so that meant you, know, you wanted 100,000 ads to be shown and you wanted to pay $20 per thousand. So you were willing to pay whatever that works out to. Um, $2 million. So, no, $20,000. I can't do math, sorry. Um, and so there wasn't really any feedback online, right? When the New York Times prints their newspaper and mails it to whoever they mail it to, uh, some people see it, some people don't, some people care, some people don't. That was basically it, right? You could basically phone people, you could do a survey to find out who cared about the ad, who saw the ad, who remembered the slogan, but that was about it. Uh, online, totally different world. Impressions can actually be sold automatically in real time. They can be sold one by one. So. Whereas before you used to phone up the New York Times and say, hi, next month I want 100,000 ads. Now the New York Times calls you and you have 250 milliseconds to buy that ad, that impression, which is actually kind of shocking. It was kind of shocking to me when I first heard about it. Uh, so you can buy impressions one at a time and you get full feedback. You know whether or not the person who was viewing the website saw the ad, or presumably you know whether it was on the screen or not. You know whether they clicked on it. With a little bit of fancy tracking, you can know whether they clicked on it and then subsequently bought your product, okay? So there's a lot more tracking and a lot more sort of real-time, disaggregated, one-by-one -one, uh, opportunities to show and, and follow up on advertising online. And so that's why there are so many middlemen because, well, you know, basically publishers traditionally were people who printed newspapers, wrote articles, articles operated TV stations, operated radio stations. Um, the notion of sort of selling ads one at a time, hundreds of thousands of times per second, it's pretty far outside of their uh, outside of their wheelhouse, and they tend to hire people like, like you and me, computer scientists, software engineers, to take care of this for them, and that's a, a big business opportunity. So a whole bunch of different companies have arisen uh, to to address that. So far, so good. Vaguely interesting. Mm -hmm. Too fast. <laughs> okay. So basically, I mean, the core the core idea is that every web page is unique, right? Uh, newspapers, radio, television, this is all like broadcast, one to many. There's one big tower, a whole bunch of receivers, um, and everybody has the same, uh, gets the same content. So every copy of the newspaper is the same, everyone gets the same content and the same ads. The web is much more one to one, right? When your browser phones up the, the server and says, give me a web page, that server makes a decision. It decides which content to show you and it decides which ads to show you. And that's sort of very much a one to one uh, type situation. So that's essentially why we can do. Uh, uh, so much personalization online and why th this industry is much more complicated online. So how did these middlemen sort of come about? And I'm getting to auction theory, I promise, but I got I to set up the context. <laughs> so how did these middlemen sort of come to, come to be? Well, first of all, you got to remember in the beginning, in the beginning, in like 95, there were no big websites, right? Everything was small. From the point of view of the TV industry, there was no big websites, right? The, the New York Times had a vast distributorship compared to any website. Um, and so big advertisers didn't really want to deal with lots of tiny websites, right? When people talked about advertising online, it was like, well, we, you know, I'm used to phoning up the New York Times and saying 100,000. I don't want to call up Nick's blog and say three, <laughs> you know, basically. So. Let me just talk to you for a second. I'm a bit confused about these 100,000. You said, call the New York Times and say, I want 100,000. 
hundred thousand what? Sorry, I, I always fall into this industry jargon. So uh, I want to, from from an advertiser's perspective, I want to buy a hundred thousand impressions. So what? So that means I want you to print a hundred thousand copies of my ad. Okay, but isn't it just as many uh, copies of the newspaper I'm printing? Like you said, then you said that it's the same sure. newspaper gets so 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 the the, the, the the quantum was essentially one newspaper's worth. Right, okay. so let's say the the New York Times has a readership of, I, I, to be honest, I don't know what it is, but <laughs> let's say it was it was a hundred thousand. Yeah. That meant that the if I if I bought a hundred thousand from you, it meant you would print my ad once, one day, and that was it. Okay, I see, I see, I see. So that I I see. So if I bought more, then it would be like for two, two days. days, three yeah. days in a row. Okay. Or so let's say there's a special about. insert that gets sent to everyone in Brooklyn. You know, you okay. can basically say everyone in Brooklyn should get this, and that worked out to be <laughs> however many. Thousands. All right. Um, I'm recording this. I'm sure anybody in the industry who's going to be watching this will be like, Nick, what are you talking about? 100,000. But anyway, um, yes. So okay. when an advertiser buys impressions, what that means is they pay the publisher to show those impressions. But from an economic perspective, we consider the advertiser to be demand because they're the one buying and the publisher to be supply because they're the one selling, right? Uh, so yeah, that's the. Uh, and actually, interestingly enough, um, in the industry, we talk about the publisher's uh, content, for lack of a better word, to be inventory, which is kind of funny, right? So the little box into which the New York Times can print an ad is considered to be inventory that I can buy. <coughs> so I've bought the right to put my ad there. Um, okay. So yeah, like I was saying back, back in the day, you know, big advertisers didn't really want to deal with all of these little websites. Um, and quite frankly, by the time there were big websites around, most of them didn't really want to deal with lots of little tiny advertisers, with one big asterisk, which I'll get to in my next slide. Um, and so middlemen essentially showed up to solve this problem. They, they essentially, they match markets. So I don't know if you guys have gotten to chapter 10 in your textbook, but I thought it was really neat, um, <laughs> about basically how to deal with sort of matching some supply and some demand and the algorithms and sort of uh, economic theory that applies to that. Um, so middlemen essentially solved this problem. Uh, websites will use them as a source of ads. So whenever a website is creating a web page to be sent back to a browser, they can essentially have some kind of interaction with a middleman and say, okay, I want an ad now. Give me an ad. Um, and the advertisers, uh, from the advertiser's perspective, a middleman is like a big pool of inventory. So if I'm a middleman, I can have a relationship with 800 bloggers who have individually each a very small amount of traffic, but I can turn around and I can sell a very large block of impressions to an advertiser. So middlemen kind of arose uh, online as, an, as a way of packaging up uh, online inventory that was too small and presenting it to big, uh, big advertisers. So the big asterisk uh, is that some big websites actually do want to deal with lots of tiny, tiny advertisers. Uh, the most famous one, obviously, is Google. So Google, um, in the sort of ontology of, of online advertising, is a publisher. Um, Many people think of Google as being a middleman, and it does play that role in some markets, but with respect to search, with respect to Google.com, Google is a publisher, right? You go there, it gives you a web page. Um, it's a middleman on your way to whatever it is you're looking for, but from the point of view of the publisher-advertiser dichotomy, it's very much a publisher. Um, and they basically make all of their money by allowing any tiny uh, advertiser to show you know, eight ads a month or whatever uh, on, on the main, main page of Google.com. Uh, so they've developed all sorts of user interface and tools uh, and auction-based kind of algorithms for doing that, and they've become obviously a hugely dominant company in that space. Um, that's basically chapter 15 in your textbook, which is also very interesting. I'm not going to be talking so much about that, but there's a lot of parallels uh, between that and what I'm going to talk about. And if there's time at the end, which is sort of a balance between me speaking too fast and you understanding anything I say, <laughs> um, there'll be uh, there'll be some time at the end to talk about how. Uh, our business compares to this. Uh, and then obviously, uh, Facebook is also one of the biggest publishers in the world today. There's a lot of other um, tech savvy publishers who use similar tools to Google. Um, so so those, are, those are kind of exceptions to my, my rule. Um, and just to be, to, to be clear about terminology, um, the word banner has kind of a bad connotation since people don't like banners. So in ad tech, we call banners display advertising meaning little pictures, um, and search advertising is sort of the other, the other thing, right? So search advertising, or, or it, it tends to be text, uh, people don't mind that, and display advertising tends to be banners, and people tend to mind that more. So uh, most of what I'm going to be talking about is, is around display advertising. So um, 
from a sort of academic perspective, uh, the display advertising matching problem, which is what the middleman does all day, um, is you know if you're a middleman, every time a web page loads anywhere on the web, basically potentially, someone can call you and say, "Give me an ad." Okay, so what do you do? <laughs> um, and then when I say call you, I mean you know their their server calls your server, and it's a very short conversation. Um, so you're basically matching supply and demand. Supply in this case. Uh, which is kind of funny because it's demanding to you. Supply is a long stream of web page views, right? Just people calling you all the time. So, you know, estimates for online ads are in the sort of 10 to 100 million requests per second, right? Obviously, every time anybody clicks on a web page, it's a lot. Um, so that's that's considered supply because every web page that is rendered is an opportunity for your ad or for someone's ad <laughs> to be shown. Um, on the other side, you have demand. Demand uh, is essentially from the middleman's perspective, a set of advertising campaigns, right? That's how advertisers view the world. Um, and each, each campaign has a sort of unique set of constraints and goals. So uh, when Procter & Gamble, it's a bad example because they don't advertise online very much, but when Ford shows up and says, okay, I want to target university students with whatever car it is that they're selling to university students, they'll have some constraints. I don't want to spend more than $10,000 this month. They'll have some goals. I want to show however many ads. I want people to click however many times. That's, that's what the demand looks like from the perspective of the middleman. And so the problem in a computer science sense is to define a policy that for a given uh, web page opportunity, you choose among the various campaigns, and usually campaigns have multiple creatives, you choose one creative and you give it back, while simultaneously meeting everybody's constraints and optimizing everybody's goals. So it's starting to feel a little bit more like the type of grad student problem that we're you know, used to, to thinking about. So uh, constraints and goals. Well, what are the constraints and goals that matter in, in this particular context? So this is a little bit small. So the publishers, uh, one thing that publishers care a lot about, there are certain kinds of ads that they do not want on their site, right? I'm pretty sure anybody can think about that. But for example, you know, the mobile strike thing with like a lot of violence and Arnold Schwarzenegger in a military uniform. You know, some blog about flowers is not going to want Arnold Schwarzenegger on their, you know, banner or whatever. But that's kind of clear. Um, publishers basically they want to, um, sorry, they have, yeah, they have sold you the, their space to you potentially as a middleman for a given number uh, of dollars per thousand impressions. So the way that um, this hypothetical middleman I'm explaining here works, they basically have pre-sold. A bunch of inventory. So they've told the publisher, I will put a whole bunch of ads and I'll pay you however much uh, per thousand. So essentially the publisher has has uh, has sold to you that space and, and you as the middleman must give them that money, right? Um, and the publisher probably wants some portion of your revenue, right? They don't want to say, well, I sold you this stuff for five bucks, but you're going to make 300. So they, 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 might, they might want a small slice of whatever it is that you're making. The advertiser, on the other hand, while certain advertisers don't want their ads on a certain kind of site, Right, so particular uh, particular example, you know, Ford probably does not want their ads showing up right next to, you know, the article in La Presse that talks about the car accident that happened yesterday, for example. <laughs> um, they've basically bought outcomes. So from the perspective of an advertiser, an outcome can be something really simple like an impression. So my ad was shown. It can be uh, a click, right? Someone clicks on an ad, um, or it can be an action. Someone sees my ad and then fills out a survey, or clicks on my ad and then buys something. So, um, and these outcomes are essentially sold on what's called a CPC basis, a cost per click basis. So the way that works is basically, I'm using Ford as an example, but Ford will, will come to a middleman and say, hi, I wanna buy 10,000 clicks, and I wanna pay a dollar per click. And the middleman says, sure. So now the middleman has a deal with some people saying, well, I'm gonna give you a certain fixed amount of money for uh, advertising space, and on the other side, okay, they said, well, I'm, I've taken a certain amount of money from uh, the advertiser, and I've got to return a bunch of clicks. So now I've got to kind of constrain this, right? So obviously, uh, at the end of the month, I need to make sure that I've taken in more money than I've taken out, and I want to keep uh, a slice of that, right? So I want to maximize the amount of, uh, I, I, I keep. But if at the end of the month, I haven't actually returned my advertiser enough clicks, they're not going to come back next month, and so I've lost them as an advertiser. Ditto, if at the end of the month, you know, I, I bought a whole bunch of inventory from, um, from a publisher and I don't actually send them the money <laughs> or I don't send them the ads, they're not going to come back next month. And for sure, if I show an ad on the wrong website, 
uh, or if I show the wrong website, the wrong ad on a, on a website, uh, either my advertiser or my publisher is not going to renew their contract. So as a middleman, that's, that's the sort of balancing act. And so there's an interesting sort of social sales layer that, that uh, takes place here. So for example, uh, when you have more publishers signed up than, than, uh, than advertisers, all your salespeople go and call all the advertisers they know. And then when they do a good job, you have more advertisers than publishers, all your salespeople go and call the publishers they know. And you gotta kinda keep those matched, right? So you can't have like star saleswoman over on the publisher side and then like all the losers on the, on the advertiser side because then you, you won't balance your books at the end of the month. So there's an interesting kind of sales thing going on, but um, uh, the, the sort of, you know, in computer science class, you're more interested in the, the sort of uh, software problem. So finally, I'm gonna get to auctions, chapter nine in your book. Um, so, Many middlemen kind of solve this problem using fairly complicated linear algebra um, that's a little bit over my head. <laughs> I read some of this, those papers and I was like, okay, I can see roughly how you do this. There's like a dual primal problem and typical linear algebra operations research stuff. But around 2010, uh, a new thing started to happen due to essentially cloud computing and, and a bunch of uh, technological advances called uh, real-time bidding, which basically uh, allowed the uh, online advertising economy to become much more, a little bit more like the stock market, let's say. So the middleman became an exchange, uh, essentially a clearinghouse for demand and supply. So what would happen back in the day is you would get, back in the day, now we're talking like 2000, right? <laughs> you would get a, a request for an ad and you would put it through your large uh, matrix algebra machine and it would tell you sort of which, uh, which ad to show and every few hours you would solve this large matrix problem and that was that. Now, in 2016, what happens is, if you're a middleman, if you're an exchange, you get a request for, uh, for an ad to show on a website, and you turn around, and you blast that request out to, let's say, 100 advertisers. And basically, you say, hi, I have this ad, please bid. I'm going to run an auction, 250 milliseconds. So now these advertisers uh, each have to return a bid to you. So the, the thing that I send as a middleman uh, is called a bid request. I'm requesting a bid. It's a little bit like a request for proposals or a call for papers or something like that. So each advertiser then uh, bids on the ad, on the right to, to, to show their ad uh, in the, so they bid on the, the spot. <laughs> they, they bid for the right to show an ad in the spot and, and realize an impression. Uh, once all the bids are collected, the exchange will run an auction and the ad gets shown. So let me kind of walk you through uh, what that looks like. These slides are out of order. But okay, um, so from the point of view of the middleman, this is great, right? Now the middleman basically just has a technical problem to solve, right? They just have pipes to plug together. I need, I get a whole bunch of inputs. I just need to broadcast things out. I collect the answers. I do a bit of math. I send the ad back and I take a fee from every auction, right? And I'm no longer on the hook. I didn't pre-buy the inventory, so I don't owe anybody any money. And I didn't pre-sell any outcomes, so I don't owe anybody any clicks. I'm just a middleman now. This is great, right? I can just take my... My, uh, my little slice of the icing off the cake. Um, so the middleman, this, this is great. On the other hand, now the advertiser has a bit of a problem, right? Back in the day, it was pretty easy. You would just phone up your local middleman and you say, a thousand clicks, please, a buck. Now it's, oh, you're sending me a stream of 100,000 requests per second and I need to bid. Opportunities for more middlemen to arrive. Um, <laughs> so basically the problem from an advertiser's perspective is given a long stream of bid requests, long in, you know, in volume and very, very quick. Uh, how do I bid to optimize my goals, right? We just move the problem to somebody else's backyard. Um, so as a note, what Datacratic does, the reason I'm here, and the reason I know anything about this at all, is that we sell a system called RTB Optimizer, Real-Time Bidding Optimizer, uh, that does this. So we sell RTB Optimizers to uh, middlemen who sit between the exchange and the advertiser. So we are way down on the stack, which is why our logo is not on the slide. Um, but uh, I, I've done a lot of the math for this, so uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm here to talk to you about it. <laughs> so um, let's just kind of walk through an auction step by step, so you guys kind of understand what I'm going to talk about when I say here's the optimal way to bid. Um, so uh, you guys did auctions last week, right? Mm -hmm. So real-time bidding is essentially a second price auction, um, and it's a single item. So the publisher wants an ad from the exchange. So their server calls up. So the exchange says, okay, I got an ad. Uh, you know, I'm La Presse, say, uh, it's the sports page, it's about the Canadians, they won, surprise. Uh, it's for one of those little ads that's sort of long and skinny. Um, it's two in the morning, uh, it's a 33-year-old male uh, in Montreal. Okay, so that's the description of 
of the ad that that's about to be shown. Uh, and so, so the, where, where does the three-year-old male come in? I mean, uh, you talked about the press; they want to sell this rectangular space. Yeah. Yes. So the thirty-three-year-old male. Everybody asks about that. Surprisingly, <laughs> um, basically, you know, the press can either buy information about their, uh, and I say that press as a stand-in for yeah. all publishers. Um, publishers can buy information about their uh, their users essentially oh, from see. third parties, or they can build a profile. So you know, the stuff that I browse on La Presse, oh, let's okay. say. That's Mix the webpage, it, they're, show, they're yeah. showing it to a 33-year-old. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah exactly. So it's, it's, so it's me. Yeah. Um, so again, <laughs> industry jargon, you know, La Presse is just selling me, right? I mean, they're not really selling me. They're selling the right to show someone an ad who might be me. Um, so the exchange turns around and uh, says to, you know, to advertisers A and B, let's say, okay, you know, I got this guy I want to who wants to show him an ad. Here you go. So the uh, advertiser A bids, um, and here the units are kind of interesting. So because uh, this industry comes from... <coughs> essentially print and broadcast media, we still quote all prices in CPM, in cost per thousand. Um, except CPMs for print media or for like the Super Bowl or something are very, very, very high in the sort of, first of all, in the dollars, not in the shreds of a dollar. And you know, they can go up to $200 per thousand, let's say. Um, so, but, but online, obviously, a single, a single impression isn't worth very much. Uh, so A bids a dollar CPM, which for a single impression works out to a thousand micro dollars, a thousand millionths of a dollar. So we call those micros because uh, in real-time bidding, you tend to think about things one at a time. And B bids too. So B bids 2,000 micro dollars. So because this is a second price auction, uh, obviously, well, first of all, B wins because they bid, they bid more. But in terms of what they pay, in a second price auction, uh, the winner only pays enough to clear the price of the, the second uh, price. So in this case, the second price was 1,000. B bid uh, 2,000. B wins, but they pay, let's say, 1,200, right? So 1,200, you need to... You always need to bid a little higher than the second price because otherwise the exchange the uh, the auction doesn't work. Um, and essentially, the exchange will keep a little slice. So in this particular case, the exchange is taking a very healthy twenty percent. Um, <laughs> so B wins and pays twelve hundred micros. The exchange keeps two hundred, so they're happy. Their goals are met, um, and gives a thousand micros to the publisher. Okay, great. And then the publisher shows B's ad. <laughs> so that's the RTB auction. This happens ten million times a second. Or 100 million times a second. I don't really know what the number is now, but it was 10 million last time I looked. Um, and so, uh, Datacratic software, and what I'm going to describe to you in a second, basically, uh, B could be running RTB Optimizer, and uh, the output of RTB Optimizer was this 2000 number. Any questions on the framing of the problem? So, as I'm sure uh, you guys covered last week, the uh, optimal sort of uh, bidding behavior in second price auctions uh, is to bid truthfully. Okay, great. I, uh, when I was designing the, the bidding algorithm, the first generation bidding algorithm for Datacratics Optimizer, I looked that up and I was like, awesome. What's truth? Okay, well, <laughs> if you need to bid truthfully, um, you know, we, it, for a house, it's pretty easy. Well, pretty easy. You can say this house is worth X to me and I'm gonna bid X. Um, in, in the context of an online advert, uh, an online impression, you don't really know actually how much it's worth, right? Because I'm going to show an ad, they might not get seen, it might not get enjoyed, it might not get clicked on, right? But we can use uh, basic expected utility theory uh, to kind of get us out of this part of the problem. So expected utility theory says if x, whatever x is, is worth some value v, and it's likely to happen with probability p, then its actual worth is v times p, right? So uh, if I have a dice and I say I'm going to give you a dollar, if the dice is six and I roll it, the value to you of playing this game is one over six. Okay, so if X is a click, let's say, um, and then bid bidding truthfully means that you're going to bid however much the click is worth to you times the probability that someone is going to click. So if you wanted to bid truthfully in, on, in, in RTB, uh, you need to be able to estimate the probability of a click, of, of, <coughs> excuse me, of a click which kind of closes the circle as to why a machine learning company is talking about this. We use machine learning to determine the probability of a click. That's what uh, Datacratic's RTB Optimizer is. I'm not advertising it to you guys. You guys aren't advertisers, so. <laughs> but, it, but it's interesting to talk about how it works. Yeah. Native touch. Native touch. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, you're not allowed to look at the next person. No. <laughs> um, so uh, what was I talking about? So yeah, you need to estimate uh, p-click. So interestingly, in a lot of the literature uh, around online, uh, you know, real-time bidding or, or online auctions, uh, basically people say, well, you know, the advertiser knows, knows the click-through rate. Click-through rate, CTR, essentially is the probability of a click, right? It's how many impressions get clicked on. And therefore, you bid this way. It's like, well, 
you don't actually know ahead of time in real-time bidding what the probability of a click is, right? what the click-through rate is, because it hasn't happened yet. So this is why we use machine learning to do this. Um, the, the problem is that, that that's a very, very simplified view of the world. right? So first of all, you've got to deal with pacing. Um, as a constraint, the advertiser doesn't give you an infinite amount of money uh, to spend. right? Uh, in fact, advertisers, as part of their media plan, tend to have a certain budget allocated to how much money to spend on a particular campaign. So say an advertiser wants to spend $10,000 over 30 days. It's not unreasonable. Um, if you divide that through in micro dollars and divide by the number of seconds per day, um, it works out to about 3,800 micro dollars per second on average, you know, if you're perfectly, if you're perfectly evenly spending, which at a dollar CPM works out to about three ads a second. Okay, so for this campaign, in order to meet the, the advertiser's uh, pacing constraint, you gotta show roughly three ads a second. So if you just bid truthfully, uh, your spend rate will vary completely with supply, probably violating your constraint, keeping in mind the global supply is up in the, you know, 10 to 100 million uh, queries per second, and most advertisers or most uh, advertising bidding systems uh, only subscribe to about 100,000 QPS. Even still, if you're bidding truthfully, you're likely to spend way more money than that, right? You're, bidding to, you're, you're, you're likely to buy way more ads than three per second, so you probably need to do something other than bidding truthfully. Um, a uh, datacratic system basically uses a closed loop control system um, to, to do this. Uh, so this was my big algorithmic contribution as I designed the first generation pacing system for datacratic. Um, which basically says, we look at how much money we spent over the last time increment, say two minutes, and if we spent too much, then we turn some knob down, right? And in RTB, there are basically two knobs that you can, two levers that you can pull. You can modulate the frequency, you can sort of not bid every time, uh, or you can modulate the magnitude. So you can bid less, untruthfully, shocking. Actually, both of these are bidding untruthfully because if you're modulating frequency, you're essentially untruthfully saying, no, no, this ad is worth zero. Or this impression is worth zero. I don't wanna, I don't wanna buy it. Um, so essentially, right away, uh, we get off the, the, the tracks theoretically because we need, to, we need to do something other than just bidding truthfully because of real world constraints like lack of infinite budget. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, that was basically the point on that side. So what a, a sort of untruthful uh, bidding policy looks like uh, is actually pretty simple. Um, we said that our, our, our bid was going to be the value of whatever it is times the probability of whatever it is that was going to happen. Uh, here we just multiply it by some number r, which comes out of our pacing system. So v, so and sorry, we get the bid is v times r times uh, the probability of the outcome happening. So r comes from our pacing control system at any point in time our pacing system says, well, you, you know, uh, at the last time increment, you spent twice as fast. So you divide R by two, um, and then that'll, that should, if, if, uh, if spending is linear to your bid, that should get you back on track. Spending doesn't turn out to be linear to your bid, but you can kind of oscillate around the, around the set point and it works out. Um, so that's basically a, an untruthful bidding policy. So there's kind of an inbuilt tension here, right? Because um, R, essentially, if R is one, then you're bidding truthfully. And if R is zero, then you're not bidding. And if there's a huge supply, then you're likely, R is likely to be very, very, very small. And so you're essentially bidding these tiny shreds uh, all the time. Um, excuse me. And so you're actually bidding way less than something's worth to you. So you're likely to get an effective cost per whatever is of interest to you of much, much less than V, right? So you're not actually, you're not actually bidding truthfully. You're not getting truthful outcomes. In fact, you're getting something for way cheaper than you're willing to pay for it which can be neat, but kind of violates the basic idea of bidding truthfully, which is that your, your profit is gonna be close to zero. Um, something I wanna mention though is in practice, we definitely don't always bid because computational load matters, right? Um, in a lot of the literature, transaction costs, which is basically like what it actually costs to play the game, uh, are either ignored or you just plus epsilon or something like that. In practice, it's actually really difficult to estimate, right? Because when your system is fully loaded and it's actually doing computations 100,000 times per second, um, you know how much your system costs to run per month, right? You get your bill from Amazon or from your provider at the end of the month, um, but you don't know ahead of time how many auctions you're gonna process. So the, the, the transaction cost is variable based on the load. Uh, and so the, in practice, your real-time control system kind of plays with both levers. You play with both magnitude uh, and frequency. And so we, what we, we call it dropping bid requests. Basically bid requests come in and we say, ah, no, I don't have time, I don't have time, I don't have time, uh, just to kind of modulate, modulate that. And transaction costs matter because we pass those on to our customers, right? So if as an advertiser, you're paying, you know, you're, you're, you think you're bidding uh, V times P, if you want us to compute P 
for every single impression, and there's 10, you know, 10 million of them, then you're going to pay us way more than you're going to get out of showing the ads. So transaction costs matter a lot. So I think I, I kind of went ahead of myself on this slide here, but it's important to keep in mind the sort of goals versus constraints of the advertiser, right? Is the goal to actually uh, get an effective cost per outcome of V? If something is worth V to me, do I actually want to spend V to get it? Kind of not a trick question, right? In most academic uh, papers, you kind of assume that that's true, or you assume that there's equilibrium, and so you're going to pay, you know, V minus epsilon, and you're going to get the thing, and you're going to be epsilon happy. Most people are not happy with that, right? If a house is actually worth, you know, X to me, I would like to get it for less than X, right? Because otherwise, I feel like I haven't made any profit, especially if I'm planning to sell it for X. Um, so in practice, there's actually a really strong tension between spending at a certain rate and maximizing profit, right? If I'm actually modulating my spend rate so as to get something for exactly what it's worth to me, I'm not making any money. <laughs> and if my job, uh, if in fact, uh, and I'm not an advertiser, but I'm actually selling the impression, I'm actually, sorry, I've actually pre-sold the, the click, so I'm actually uh, an ad network, V is not some abstract quantity, right? I've actually sold this click for a thousand dollars, a thousand micros, let's say. Um, I'm, I'm making money off the difference. So I want to make, I want to buy it for a lot less than what I've sold it for, right? There's, there's this trade-off curve essentially between uh, how, what, maximizing your profit and spending a certain amount of money. So in some cases, you hit diminishing returns pretty quickly. Your profit per actual transaction is, is you know, you, you can maximize it by only spending five bucks a day. And then you can spend $6 a day, but your profit goes down. Your profit margin per, per transaction goes down. Uh, or, you know, everything is going gangbusters. It's great. I could actually, I could actually profitably spend another $10,000. So essentially, what the profit point is has almost nothing to do with my willingness to spend and everything to do with the supply. So what kind of inventory I have access to, right? If I'm showing, uh, you know, if I'm selling like diamond rings on the New York Times main page, that's, that's one thing. I might not have access to that inventory uh, because... You know, they're cheap diamond rings or something, I don't know. Um, so the, the supply that I have access to is definitely a factor. And then if you look at my, my equation here, my bid is V times R times P. If P, the probability of something happening, which is the outcome of a predictive model, if my predictive model is crap and doesn't actually predict anything, then uh, I'm not actually going to get uh, any good profit, right? So the, the easiest way to compute P is you just look historically. You say, well... In general, people click on about one every thousand ads. So P is going to be about one every thousand. But then you get almost no differentiation, right? Anybody can do that. So you essentially, if everybody, everybody bid this way, it would just kind of be rolling dice and everybody get, would get essentially no profit. The perfect predictor essentially says that P is zero all the time, right? And once in every thousand, it says P is one. <laughs> and then you essentially buy very, very, very few ads. You buy all the ones that people are going to click on, and then you can't spend any money, right? Because you buy one out of every thousand ads, and ads don't cost very much. So there's this kind of tension between how much you can spend and how much you can get. And it depends on the supply, um, which is generally kind of out of your control, right? However many web pages are on the internet and however many, however many come in to <coughs> your bidding system. Uh, and then the quality of your predictor, which is something that we at least at Data Pratic have a, a lot of control over. And that's why we invest <coughs> a lot of energy into uh, making high quality predictors. So then the other thing I'm going to throw in just to kind of throw wrenches into this, this theory um, is sort of beyond truth. What if you don't know what V is, right? Um, so how much do you think it's actually really monetarily worth to Ford if you click on one of their ads? <coughs> I don't expect anybody to raise their hand because I don't think anybody knows, right? Ford can, someone can construct a complicated model to actually guess, but I mean... I guarantee you one thing, when you click on an ad, Ford doesn't actually get any of your money, right? Ford has some likelihood of maybe eventually down the line, you look at the car, you tell your friend, your friend thinks it's good, and then maybe their buying decisions three years from now are impacted by this interaction or something. But I'm not on thin ice when I say it's fairly indirect, right? So from Ford's perspective, does it make sense for them to say, I absolutely want these clicks at $1. I will not pay, you know, more than that. Well, no, <laughs> right? I mean, they might say that, but there's no actual like, strongly assigned value to, to, to that number. So most advertisers basically, they just want the lowest cost per outcome. They say, look, I want people to go to my website and I'm not willing to pay, and I don't wanna be a sucker, right? I don't wanna pay 10 bucks per click if I can get them for nine. And I don't wanna pay nine if I can get them for eight. So I just wanna get the lowest number possible. So uh, how do you optimize this, right? How do you get the lowest 
cost per, let's say, click for a given budget. Well, it turns out that the equation is actually the same. You can just factor out V, right? So if you bid with just R times the probability, and R comes out of your control system, so R is basically modulated to hit your spend target, and you just bid proportionally uh, to the probability <laughs> of outcome, which means you're still bidding loosely within the bounds of expected value theory, right? Something twice as, if something is twice as likely, you're still bidding twice as much, but essentially your value is entirely represented by how much you're willing to spend, which actually kind of makes sense because you don't know how much it's worth, but you know you're willing to spend $10,000 for as many as possible. And that's what that equation says, right? <laughs> so the control system adjusts R to hit your pace, which is the only thing you told me. You didn't tell me how much it wants you, how, much, how many you want, you just told me how, you, how much you're gonna spend. Well, this is how much you're gonna get, right? And so here, the effective cost per outcome, the ECPX, X being outcome, um, will depend again on the supply and the quality of the predictor, right? So if the supply is trash and no one ever clicks on these ads because whatever, they're like, you know, tech students. From the point of view of, of advertisers, uh, tech students are terrible at uh, inventory because they don't tend to click on things, right? Everyone's got an ad blocker or something like <laughs> that. <laughs> um, well, ad blockers interact with real-time bidding a little bit differently, right? Okay. But anyway, you know, if people don't click, the inventory isn't worth very much. Uh, and it also, again, depends on the quality of your predictor, right? If you're very, very good at sort of sniping out the the, the inventory where someone's going to click, you can actually get very, very low, low uh, effective cost per outcome. And if you're just bidding at sort of the noise floor of, well, people click roughly once every one or 2,000, so that's what I'm going to do, um, then you're essentially bidding just proportionally to what your budget is. So when I kind of worked out all the math and convinced myself that this was true, I was like, it can't be that simple. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's, it's optimization, right? Is it really like you build a real-time control system and you just kind of look back two minutes, am I spending too much? Yes, tune it down a little bit. Uh, it turns out that this, this actually works fairly effectively uh, as, a, um, as a bidding strategy. And I've written a couple of articles on our website where I kind of work out some, uh, some of the math. I didn't feel like doing the proofs for you guys on the board because it would be boring for both sides, I think. <laughs> but I can, uh, um, I'm recording this, so I'm putting, going to put this on uh, online, and I'll put a couple links to the, the papers that I've written about this for, for sort of general interest. Um, so, so sort of overarching lessons for uh, advertisers trying to solve the advertiser problem. Uh, auction theory is very useful for sort of understanding and framing the problem. Um, and I, you know, I enjoyed reading a lot of papers uh, about this when I was first researching this problem, and I enjoyed the textbook that you guys are working with. Um, the auction theory is frequently oversimplified, right? It's like, oh, assume you know V, assume you know the CTR, assume you know this. Well, in practice, you don't know much, right? You just have some server calling you saying, you have 250 milliseconds to tell me something. <laughs> um, so first of all, unknown private values. If you don't know how much something is worth to the person you're bidding for, you can't bid truthfully. So that part of the theory is out the window. Uh, you don't actually know the likelihood of the outcome, right? Assume you know the CTR. Well, if I knew the CTR, right, <laughs> my life would be a lot easier. So you have an unknown uh, probability of outcome. You must estimate it with something. We use machine learning. There are probably other ways. Uh, you have no idea of what the future supply looks like, right? So theoretically, people could stop browsing the internet tomorrow, and there would be many fewer web pages and many fewer uh, impressions. <laughs> On the other hand, some major event could happen tomorrow which would cause many, many more web pages to be generated tomorrow, and therefore the supply actually grows. Or, um, anyway, lots of different things could happen. So you don't actually know much about the future supply, so you can't actually, um, you can't say, oh, well, you know, I'm not gonna spend today. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait till tomorrow because the inventory will be better. Or, oh my goodness, this inventory is great and it'll be terrible tomorrow, so I'm gonna spend my money today. Right, you kinda have to make some judgment, and in general you kinda say, well, we'll pace evenly and hope for the best. Um, and so, you know, you, can, you have to pace with some sort of closed loop control system. Um, and pretty much no matter the scenario for um, what your goals and constraints are, the quality of your outcome uh, will depend on the quality of the supply that you have and the quality of your predictor. Uh, and so as computer scientists, we can work pretty hard on the predictor, less hard on the supply. Um, let me kind of dive into the supply piece of that a little bit. Um, as an advertiser, the supply you have and I've, I've gone pretty deep into the layers of abstraction, so let me unroll it a little bit. Supply is uh, a steady stream of opportunities to show ads, right? Um, and so I've said that there exist these exchanges, and as an advertiser, these exchanges call you. So the thing is, you actually need to make a deal with these exchanges, right? You have to say to the exchange, well, I'm going to spend $10,000 this month on you, and then the exchange is willing to do business with you. So the very high quality exchanges maybe have higher floors, and so if you're a small advertiser, First of all, if you're a small advertiser, you often can't afford to build a system like this. Um, but you might not have access to the type of supply uh, that is, that is uh, you know, 
very rich people or something like that, <laughs> um, or, 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 or the, the kind of target market for your, uh, for your product. Um, so you, and you also, most advertisers can't afford to connect to, you know, 50 exchanges and get a, a large um, supply of supply, <laughs> a large stream of bid requests. So uh, supply is often not much of a technical problem, much more of a sort of business problem. I have 10 minutes. Or so. Um, so I've got sort of two more, uh, two more slides, a conclusion, and then I can stop talking and you can ask some questions if you want. Um, there's also, I've talked a lot about the middleman problem and basically kind of wave my hands and say, oh, well, it's sort of solved by exchanges, which is nice. Um, the advertiser problem is what I've spent most of my intellectual energy, but there is also a publisher problem, right? The publisher wants to maximize his or her revenue for their inventory. So the publisher has a lot of uncertainty, right? If you're the New York Times, you don't actually know how many web pages you're going to generate in the next month. It's variable. You can kind of juice the numbers if you want. You can print more salacious stories and get your numbers up. You can hope for a scandal, but like, really, you don't have a ton of prediction, and especially when you get down to the different sections. You know, you might have a rough guess as to what your readership overall is going to be, but you don't know what the mix is going to be between home and and cooking and sports and cars, and so there's a lot of uncertainty there. But generally, what they uh, generally what they want to do is uh, is maximize maximize their revenue at the end. Of the so everyone wants to do that. So they want to maximize their, their cost per thousand, right? Every ad you want to get, get it for the biggest price. Um, but if you look at a second price auction, I mean, this is kind of the typical seller side of a second price auction. Um, if B was willing to spend $2, in my example, $2 CPM, how come they got to spend one? Like they got to keep all the surplus minus the, the exchange fee, right? So first of all, the exchange took some of my money because that person was willing to pay $2 <laughs> and they kept the other part. <laughs> so from the point of view of a, of a publisher, um, the second price auction is, is no good, right? Because you're leaving a whole bunch of money on the table in someone else's pocket. So wouldn't I make more money without a middleman? Well, probably, but then you'd actually have to go and phone B, right? <laughs> and, and, and make a deal with them. Um, and, and more importantly, would I make, wouldn't I make more, much more money with a floor price, with a reserve price of $1.99? So if I, if I basically bid on all my own ads at $1.99, then B would bid two and I would get $1.99 for whatever, you know, minus the, the epsilon that I keep on saying we hand wave about. Um, so the publishers ask themselves this kind of problem all the time, right? Should I have a floor price? Would I make more money? And there's all sorts of ways of, of, of calculating that, which we don't have a product for, so I don't know a lot about, but uh, I can speculate as to how they do that. Um, and then uh, constantly kind of asking themselves, well, do I even just ship all my inventory to a middleman as opposed to try and sell it myself? Um, and then, I assume this is a social, social network uh, class. Um, obviously, in a multi-billion dollar industry, nothing is simple. Um, there are lots of publishers, lots of advertisers, and obviously lots of middlemen, as I showed you. So um, there's not one exchange. It's not like the stock market. Actually, even the stock market, there's not one exchange. But in any case, for any given impression, uh, you can get that kind of impression on multiple different exchanges. So there's lots of middlemen actually to choose from, and you have to run a sort of overarching optimization loop to say, well, as a publisher, which middleman do I do business with? People do all these sort of interesting cascades where they'll propose an ad to one middleman and say, actually, no, I'm not getting a good enough price, I'm gonna propose it to you instead. Uh, advertisers have to choose which middlemen they connect to, and to make things even more interesting, middlemen actually cascade to each other. So middlemen say, well, I didn't get a very good price for this, I'm gonna give it to another middleman, and we'll kind of split the cut. Um, so there are all sorts of, as you said, you know, uh, the, there are all sorts of hops in between um, the marketer uh, and, and, the, and the publisher, to say nothing of the consumer, um, which is obviously a really interesting kind of uh, uh, thing to analyze. So my sort of overarching conclusions are that uh, the multi-billion dollar online in advertising industry is full of uh, market matching and auction theory problems of the type that you're studying. Um, and so this course and this textbook is, is interesting to me a priori and sort of very applicable to this industry. Um, that said, you know, theory as it's written only gets you so far. Um, you need to spend a lot of time, or at least I had to spend a lot of time understanding the sort of exact details of what people want to do, what their constraints are, why their constraints are this way. It took me a long time to understand why an advertiser wants to spend $10,000 in 30 days. Why not $12,000? Why are they unhappy when I'm underspending? You know, like we, we had situations where uh, we would uh, optimize according to certain numerical goals and the advertisers were unhappy because we didn't spend enough. Well, it turns out that their budget is spent based on, you know, the ability to repeatedly spend, <laughs> so their budget is allocated based on their ability to repeatedly spend the same amount over and over. So there's sort of, uh, from an economic perspective, what you would call irrational behavior, but it's certainly rational locally. 
Um, and then finally, obviously, you know, there's lots of opportunities out there for either employment. Um, Datacrack isn't hiring at the moment, but we, we occasionally hire. Uh, or uh, academic study of this type of problems. Uh, there's a lot of sort of lore and on the ground knowledge, um, of which I presented a bunch, <laughs> without very, very strong theory. So uh, my math abilities are, are okay, but not great. So I've proven to my satisfaction some of these results, but maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> um, uh, or maybe I should publish these things. But certainly there's lots of opportunity to study this stuff. And so this is, a, I think, a really interesting course. And I encourage you guys to. Uh, kind of take, take a closer look at this problem, uh, the problems that are here. Um, I ran out of time, I was gonna have a slide full of like links to interesting journals and stuff, but Yahoo Research has a lot of interesting papers um, and, um, and sort of following the references, but we'll, we'll get to that. That's basically all I had in terms of slides. Okay, great, well, thank you. Thank you.